let's uh, start with prayer. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful that as we look heavenward and courage fills our heart and strength and elasticity comes into our step and as joy and gladness and praise and thanksgiving come from our lips, we thank you that we can be a, a great witness to thee and to the happiness which is in heaven. And so we ask, Lord, that as we think about these things, that we will be able to uh, view what we're looking at and realize that uh, you don't want us to uh, be broken down and degenerate. You don't want us to uh, go around uh, with our faces down to the ground because we can't look up. And we thank you, Lord, that you will prevent us from having that. We would be, Lord, like uh, Moses when he was 120 years old, that his step was firm, his eye was clear, and he was walking like a young person. We ask for that blessing upon us as well. In your holy name, amen. So, the rheumatoid arthritis is the ones, and probably it's the easiest to remember. You've seen people with their hands like this. And what's happening is that the body is attacking itself. Okay, so your immune system is confused. And whatever it is that made it confused, it can be unconfused generally when you go to eating the plant-based diet. There's something called a leukotriene that won't necessarily be on the test, but that's the message units between all the different cells. And when those messages get garbled, what happens is that the body will go out and attack other things. It's supposed to attack cancer. It's supposed to attack uh, all, the, all the things which are uh, harmful to the body. But when the messages get garbled, then it starts attacking itself. And that's what it's doing. It's attacking the cartilage in the joints. Now there's other, there's other parts that can be affected by rheumatoid arthritis. But by and large, when you see hands that are like this, and it can be, it can be your knees, it can be your, your uh, ankles, it can be other joints as well, that would be the rheumatoid arthritis. And they have to do extensive, uh, expensive surgeries, and they'll go in and actually take the joint out and put a piece of plastic in there so that these joints can be straighter again. They're still crooked, but at least you can move your hands. But the best thing to do is when you start getting something like that, we've seen it over and over again. Go to the vegan diet. Don't take any of the animal products, especially milk. And I told you this uh, uh, just in one of the last lectures about the two uh, scrub nurses that when they retired from the hospital, they got an RV and they were gonna go out and they were gonna tour the country and vacation and see the places that they wanted to see all along but didn't have time. And then one of them got this crippling rheumatoid arthritis. I mean, she, she was in pain, she could hardly move. And so they came up here, both of them did, and uh, I think she stayed uh, two sessions. But anyway, she was getting better in the first session. And then finally, she decided that, that her, uh, her colleague from the from this surgery uh, floor was getting a little bit too motherly. And so she came to me and she said, Alberta is not my mother. Tell her to back off because she, she wanted she wanted her to get well so they could travel like they had planned on doing it. And so I'm, you know, but then I'm thinking inside my heart, go for it, Alberta, go, go. Because I knew she had to be totally vegan and especially off of milk protein in order to get that. We see it in other things like systemic lupus, even in multiple sclerosis and some of these things. And, and a type 1 diabetes also has been implicated many times 
that the bovine albumin that you get when you're in the nursery, when you're, when you're born, uh, from the formula that they give you, has a sequence in the islets of Langerhorn that make the, uh, the insulin in your pancreas. And when the immune system gets hyperactive, but it isn't, it isn't uh, having the right leukotrienes and the message units, is, message units are kind of garbled, then it starts attacking those cells and it knocks out the cells that make insulin. Now we're happy if somebody comes in that's just had that starting to happen because many times we can get them onto the program right away and I think the longest that a person uh, when it was a 13 year old girl that came in on a full insulin replacement and by diet, she was a homeschooler so she could do it and by diet and exercise she went in, she was still in that honeymoon phase. Now, that's a horrible name for a disease, but anyway, she was in that honeymoon phase and she didn't have to use insulin for seven years. She went to took nursing, went to take nursing, and while she was in nursing program, it was too demanding, she couldn't get the exercise and so forth. So she had to take some. But even so, people may come in with a, with a large amount of insulin that they're having to take and this is for you diabetics, and when they're on this kind of a program with the exercise, vegan, then we find that their insulin requirements go down. Why is that so important? Because the more insulin you have to take, the harder it is to lose weight. The more insulin you have to take, the faster your arteries plug up because insulin is very atherogenic. It causes, the higher the insulin levels, the more plugs you have in your arteries. That's just an aside, and that's all about autoimmune disease. This is an autoimmune disease. Osteoarthritis, that is usually a disease of overweight. That is a disease where, I can't remember what, what, the, what the amount is, but for every pound you're overweight, there's a whole lot more pressure on the cartilage on your, on your uh, your knees and on your hips and actually a problem with all the, all the bones. With a, a osteoarthritis, one of the things that's very uh, uh, damaging is that where the thumb hooks on here to the, to the small bones in the hand, that is a joint that seems to be attacked as well. We had a uh, pilot from one of the airlines he had already gotten his, his uh, surgery on his right hand. He had already retired. He would gotten surgery on his right hand and they had, they had worked on that joint there. And uh, he, I said, well, how bad was it? He said, I couldn't go over and flip a light switch on. That's how painful it was. And so at the end of the program, uh, his left hand needed to be done, but he said, you know, my left hand isn't hurting any hurting anymore. My wife has the same kind of problem with her knees if she's getting especially milk. What is this osteoarthritis and what is, it's not where the body is attacking itself per se, but it's where it's, it's uh, where it's wearing out the cushions between the joints. So with the rheumatoid arthritis, we have swelling, we have redness, and we have pain just sitting there uh, lying there, you're going to be having pain because of the inflammation and because of the swelling. The very first program that I was here in, uh, in June of, of 1989, I was not familiar with most of this stuff. I came here because I wanted to practice this type of, uh, of uh, medicine when I was in Africa, they didn't have the diseases that we have here. I was there for 15 years, and I only saw two people with a heart attack in 15 years. That was in the countries that I was in, and very, very little cancer. And so I wanted to find out what was going on here. So this young girl, she was 17, 18 years of age, and it took her three or four hours to get out of bed in the morning. She had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and at the end of the program, 
she had so little pain that she was able to walk around our half mile loop. And at the at the time of the uh, of the banquet that we had in those days of the graduation, she got up and she was telling her story and she just started sobbing. And even though I'd I'd heard which you know that she had, had rheumatoid arthritis, I had I hadn't uh, understood how extensive it was, and I hadn't understood all the different parts about her rheumatoid arthritis, and for her that had given her her life back. Now you have to do it, you have to continue to do it. The first time is the best time, and the best time is the first time. And you seem to get the most response, and then if you go off the program and you, and later you decide, no, that I, I just can't take this anymore. My pain is overcoming my appetite, and I'm going to go back on the program it may take you a lot longer to get the same results. So I'm giving that as a caveat. So the bottom line there, <clears throat> excuse me, the plant-based diet is very helpful. Okay, now here's our osteoarthritis. Here is our nice healthy cartilage. You can see there's, there's nice uh, cushions in there. And you can see the, the you're always hearing about a meniscus tear. That's the, the, another part of the cartilage that's in there. And that's what the knee looks like. But as, as the uh, bones, are, are the uh, ligaments and the muscles and the joints are getting lax, that means they're not strong and true so that when we move our knee, like this, they start to do this. If you can see, they're going a little bit from side to side. Not that much, but I have to show you that much of mo motion so you can see what's going on. So that wears on the cartilage. And the extra weight wears on the cartilage more. And then these, the bones, like I say, are always being laid down and they're always being taken apart. And after a while, this cartilage is not strong and healthy, and we get all of this, these uh, uh, formations of bone like that, and then that, that joint looks like it's pretty much shot. And you go to your orthopedist, and he says, you know, I'm, I'm looking at your, your x-rays here, <clears throat> and there's really nothing for these joints but to have them replaced. Now they used to do total replacements, but now they realize that, you know, if you put some metal and different parts into your, into your joint, is that metal being uh, rebuilt all the time like your bones and your, and your joints are? No. And so it wears out. So now what they've tried to do is they're, they're just putting metal in there as a spacer between and hoping that that'll give you a lot more time. Now, there's no, nothing for it but that you get really good relief, generally, unless uh, sometimes it doesn't go too well, sometimes uh, one leg is longer than the other and that's a problem. Uh, sometimes those metal parts can slip, sometimes they're, they're also gonna wear out. So what you would do for yourself would be to do strength training. Go to the physical therapist and in my family practice journals and, and uh, the uh, family practice news, and this is as, as long ago as seven years, they said that for the joints, and they named almost all of them, the neck, the shoulders, the hips, the knees, the ankles. If you will do physical therapy, do strength training and get that those and uh, and uh, do exercising so that the, the bones are starting to get healthier again you can actually reverse that process and if you do that within two years you're going to have the same result as far as as, as far as your function is concerned as if you had the surgery now that's amazing uh, if they replace a the hip, they're getting better at it. 
They used to do total hips and stuff like that. One of my patients has had eight hip operations. She had it when she was a child, and they just keep replacing them. My sister uh, broke her hip when she was 25, and there was a very, very good orthopedist that got out of alignment. He, he actually had to go back in, break the bone, put it back in the anatomical position, and finally at the age of 70, so 25 to 70, she had her own hip, and then it had degenerated by the time she was 70, so she's very happy to have an artificial hip. She was, well, she wouldn't particularly be uh, charmed at me saying this, but she's quite overweight, <laughs> and so that hasn't been helpful either. And so I don't know what she could have done, but anyway, that's, that's a long period of time not to have these operations. So is, is there a question about that? Because I might have left something out. I've asked the orthopedist, you know, what happens? Because the, maybe the cartilage is gone and, and it's bone on bone in there. They say, well, you know, it looks like, it seems like the body will do what it has to do. And so it will put some fibrous tissue in there. It's not that robust cartilage that you had in, in your youth but there's something there that keeps it from being bone on bone. I had a lady from Canada, she came in bone on bone with her hip, and I may have told you this, and so just in a, in a brief review, she came back the second time. You, you could put your hand there and you could feel the bones gritting. And she, the t second time she came back, uh, she was just using a cane. And then the next time, she came in on crutches, the next time she was using a cane, the next time she didn't use anything. And I said, you know, Vera, I want to know if that hurts, if you still have pain. And she said, no, I really don't. An orthopedist, a physical therapist, seeing her because her, the ball of her, of her, uh, her hips in her hip socket from the femur had drifted outward and it had worn it and worn it away. So it was flattening that. I gave her an exercise to help pull it back up, and I, I can show anybody if they, if they need to know about that one. And so when she walked, if you can see what I'm doing, you see how I'm walking? Is it, is it noticeable? What was I doing? I was lifting this hip just a tiny bit. Okay. So anyway, she was doing that because it wasn't perfect anatomical position, but she wasn't having pain. So I said, if I tell your story, I have to know when the last time was that you were having pain. And she thought about it for a while and she said, well, we were hiking up in the mountains with the children and the grandchildren. And she said, there was, there was some uh, sensitivity, some, some soreness and a little bit of pain. But she said, I think, 15 miles was too far for me to go all at one time. So here's, a, here's another one, and the, you can see that there, the erosion of the articular cartilage. It's the, it's the most common of our arthritis. Fortunately, rheumatoid is a real, real angry fellow. And the wear and tear comes from uh, the uh, too much, uh, too lax of an ar uh, of a, of the ligaments and the muscles, and too much weight on those joints where they're uh, wearing out the cartilage. Now, this is one of the handouts that I gave you there, and some people would say, "Well, you know, it just hurts, so I don't want to move it." Well, if it hurts and you don't move it, it's going to hurt worse. And so some people will just push on through that and uh, you can see there some of the ways that you can, uh, you can help your joints. And I would say mostly the strengthening exercises. The physical therapist can show you how to do it. If it's in the knees, you want to get it so that you know, this, is a, this is some real serious weights that you're able to do to strengthen those, uh, those ligaments and those joints. Now, this is a real big problem. 
And you can see where the fracture is here. This is a very common one. And what's happened is that that has gotten the uh, calcium has come out of it. Why would the calcium come out of it? Why would, why would the bone be so, so weak? You know, this is where you heard if you don't use it, you lose it. Do you know that one of the biggest problems that they had is what's going to happen to our astronauts? Because when they were just circling around the Earth a few times, they found out that those, that those uh, astronauts were losing a tremendous amount of calcium in their urine. Now, the cosmonaut that was up there for over for over uh, a year, they showed pictures of him when he came back, but he was lying down. And I understood that his bones were almost like eggshells. The calcium had gone out of him, and he probably was never able to sit up again. Well, there's a lot of things that we learn, you know, by trial and error, but they're, they're uh, trying to get past that. And so what you know, what should you do as you get older? Taking the, the vitamin D, we talked about vitamin D. Taking the calcium. Taking now, they realize that you have to have the magnesium too. You probably need to have some vitamin C, and the list goes on. We'll see in a little bit how the Africans and how the Chinese get theirs, and they don't take these supplements. And frankly, these supplements are not really all that they're, they're uh, posted to be, all that they're uh, reported to do for you. And if a person is sitting and taking all these supplements, they're not going to be getting the results anyway because it takes stress on a bone. There's something, this won't be on the test either, either. there's something called piezoelectric activity on the calcium ion. And when there's stress there, then the bones hang on to that calcium because they know that they need it for strength. Well, it's not just calcium, there's other things in bones as well. So what should you do? Yeah, get your calcium from the green leafy vegetables. Walk, okay. Now this is something that was uh, the thing that people, the, our seniors, our older people, even if they were on the farm, and farm people got a lot of protein, and they also were, were susceptible to this. In fact, the countries that have the most milk cons consumption have more of this than the ones that don't. And so there's been a lot of studies on that. The nurses' studies showed that as well. But they, you might have heard, you know, that the grandma, she went out the back door and she stepped off the back step of the porch and then she fell and she broke her hip. What actually happened? Her hip broke and that's why she fell. I've been at surgery with my gloved hand on when they were trying to do a hip replacement and I took my thumbnail with my glove on it, and I went like that, and I made a dent in, in, the, in the dense part of the bone. Now, what kind of a prosthesis would you put into balsa wood in order to have a good result? And the problem is, in the olden days, the person then would be in bed for the rest of their life, and usually, within two or three weeks or months, they would develop pneumonia because they'd been active before and they weren't. And then they, we, whoever we is, used to say that pneumonia was the old man's friend. You would go to sleep one night and you didn't wake up the next, the next day. So these are the ones. Now, you can see all the vertebral, you can see the wrist, you can see the other fractures there, but the hip is the one, you see. The hip is a problem because you may never walk again. 
and I don't know that they've taken people that were like the like the little old lady that was there that I, I put my thumb into her my thumbnail into her bone I don't know if anybody's ever tried to reverse it at that stage I don't know whether it's possible or not but don't get into that stage now which do you think is the best bone there? <laughs> well, right. Right. What? Is that my left and right mixed up? Yes. Are, is, this, is, this is the right, isn't it? I know I look at patients and for me this is the right because I'm looking at them that way, but for you, isn't this the right? Mm -hmm. This is like spider webs. What's this one? Look at all the bone and all the calcium that's in there. Dense. Yeah, it's dense. It looks what? It look, the left looks more porous because it's got more little holes all over it. Yeah, but how about the pore here? <laughs> There's a, there's a pretty big pore right there, isn't there? No, I'm sorry. I, I don't want to uh, to uh, to be little anyone, but I mean that's that's really the one on the right is uh, is really messed up. Is the one on the left uh, uh, good? Is that, uh, is that the way we want our bones to look? Absolutely. Look at how much bone is there. How much calcium is there? Uh, and then the one on the right, I mean, it's, it's just got, it just has fragments of bone there. I don't know, help me with this, because another group might say that. Why does the one on the right look better? <laughs> um, there's, almost, there's almost nothing there. Is it taken closer so those little uh, things look bigger? No, 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 uh-uh. No, that's, that's not the way it is. That's just a picture of the bone. Same, same magnification. Okay. So as I told you, I think it was yesterday, when I was in uh, Southern Africa, I was in Zambia where their principal diet was, they call them uh, sugar beans, we call them pinto beans, or any of the other beans, and corn. And they cook the corn down until you can take it out of the pot and just cut it with a knife. That's how, how dense it is. And then they eat the uh, enshima or papa or what it is with morojo. And that's the green leafy, leafy vegetables. And uh, that's where they get their calcium. And I've told some of you that I haven't told this group that how bitter they are, have I? I, I told you folks that. Did I tell you the rest of it? No, I mean, it's terribly, terribly bitter. I tried it twice. I thought, there's nothing that can be this bitter. And so another time I tried it, it, it felt like my, my toes were just kind of uh, curling up inside my shoes and they weren't going to straighten out until, I was, until about lunchtime. But uh, anyway, uh, but that is a very pleasant thing for the... Uh, for the Africans and for the uh, Chinese. When, they, the, when the Chinese think of bitter gourd or bitter lemon, their mouth starts watering. And the, and the Bantu, the Africans, that, they just crave that because they, it's very, very bitter. And, and the, uh, this, this thick corn porridge uh, that they have is very bland and they eat those together. And, and that, that's their your staple. Now, we've got somebody from the land up there. You can tell us about your experience, maybe, uh, Grant. Have you seen any of this? Well, they, they eat a lot of raw seal and, and raw whale blubber and walnuts, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But in the last few years, they've been finding traces of mercury in some of the fish up there. Into them. Okay. But they eat a lot of it, and they say if you eat raw seal, you can go out on the ice hunting, uh, dressed in your traditional seal skin carpet and, and pants, 
and you won't get cold. They say the raw seal keeps your body warm. Okay. I don't know that's now you see what what's happening though that the, that these Eskimo women especially are losing because they have so much that they're they're still getting the calcium and so forth, but there is so much protein. And remember when the protein uh, waste products goes out, it's a negative ion, the urea, and so it captures positive ions, and that could be the magnesium and the calcium, and so you're just, it's just like a sieve, your body is taking out all this calcium, and they, they really, really, uh, even though they're, like it says, they're quite physically active, still they have a, a big problem with having uh, the osteoporosis. This was uh, one of our doctors that was here before. He's down now with the uh, Adventist Health Study, Dr. Michael Orlich. And it showed the, the uh, calcium intake and most of this, in these countries here, most of them are getting it from milk. And in the nurses' study, uh, Dr. Walter Willett showed that those that took in the most uh, protein, especially from milk, at a higher rate of fractures. Can you see that, that line there? South Africa is, is, is where we were, and uh, the amount of calcium that they're, they're taking is probably around 300 uh, milligrams. And then you go up higher and higher and higher, and it really is not protective against fractures. So, you know, we keep telling you about walking, and I gave you one today about the, uh, the exercise for the diabetes, and, and that's, that's a really good study. The other thing is that the uh, exercise for the, uh, the hips as well, the, the bones. And my wife is thin, and uh, so she wears something called a walk vest. There's another one called sports armor, and then there's a third one uh, with the walk vest. It has little slits in it, and so she can put strap metal into it. So she started out with two pounds here and two pounds here, and then she kept increasing it, and then she decided, you know, this is about eight or ten pounds that I'm able to get here. I'm going to wear two of them. So she, she sort of sounded like the, the tin man, you know. <laughs> but the sports armor one has Velcro on it, and you can have it closer to your body. Now, when she went over to Africa this last time, of course, she didn't take those because she wanted to take 18 pounds of, uh, of uh, stuff for the Africans over there. So when she got back, she suits herself up, puts the 18 pounds on. We were gone for over three months, and she goes out to exercise. <laughs> you know, she's trying to climb up on the stairs over to the academy, and she practically can't make it, and she's having back pains and knee pains and stuff like that. She realized that she had left it off so long that she had to start over again with less and build it back up again. But it's really, it's really important to uh, do that now. I need to tell you about uh, Dr. Uh, well, it's not Dr., but uh, Pastor Jim Brackett. Some of you may know him. Anyway, he was in India, and he was doing some, uh, some work over there, and he came out of the, the hotel that he was in, and there was a building site. And he saw these little... Indian ladies. They probably didn't even weigh, they, they probably were 80 to 90 pounds. They were small. And there were men there that had these large sledgehammers and the trucks would come in and, and drop these huge boulders off and the men would be there all day long. And it's kind of sad, but they might only get $2 for working all day breaking up the stones.
But the th that, that was one thing. But the thing that just blew him away is that two men would pick up one of these stones and hold it up, and then this little lady with a big bundle of rags on her head would get down underneath that stone, and she would slowly push up. She would carry it on her head over to the site about where down there where the clinic is. She would lean over. It would drop it into the hole there where they were building, and then she would go back and do that again. Now she... <laughs> There's no one in this room that wouldn't have all of their, <laughs> all of their uh, cervical vertebra not just compressed down onto their shoulders. I think, I doubt that, I wonder, probably the, uh, the offensive and defensive linemen in the NFL could take that kind of, <laughs> that kind of uh, horrible, uh, pressure on those bones but I don't know who else could and so he ran back to the hotel and he he was able to get his his video camera and uh, take a picture of it I should get him to uh, let, let me show that video clip as well it's good isn't it 41 percent reduction by walking about four hours a week compared with those that walk less than one hour. And none would be less than one hour, wouldn't it? That's the trouble. 60% of Americans are what we would consider sedentary. And we talked about the sunlight and so forth yesterday. Now, these are some of the things that are known. We don't have listed there vinegar, but caffeine, steroids, uh, vinegar, some of the, the drugs that we have, alcohol, cigarettes, and depending on your race or ethnicity. Really, ladies, have you all had this bone mass density done? Everybody has. See, if you're starting to get into this area, osteopenia means that you're, you're, you've, you're getting close to osteoporosis. So if you have a minus 2.7, then you're, that, that's kind of the cutoff, uh, 2.5 and uh, 2.7 so really do get those and reverse it and it is reversible and there's the different foods now one of the things is that, and if somebody wants to know more about it one of the things is spinach rhubarb uh, well, uh, another common one that we uh, eat is chard, yeah. peanuts, and and uh, beet beet tops. If we eat those, eat those on a different day because they're high in oxalic acid and they block the absorption of calcium. So now this is the study that I was talking about, Dr. Walter Willett. I'm sorry that the red doesn't show up very well, but milk drinkers had, if anything, more fractures. And milk is not useful against osteoporosis. So there's the, where you can get your calcium from those, the green leafy vegetables. You can see up in the upper left-hand corner, that looks suspiciously, suspiciously like uh, kale, doesn't it? That, that we had two days ago, wasn't that tasty? Yeah, you know, when, when they have it like that, the, the students come over and rob our side, or if we run out, we go over and rob their side. <laughs> they don't have to put any of that stuff away. 
And so there you have it. Are, are there uh, other questions? When are you supposed to eat? Okay. So we, we, we quit on time for once, huh? <laughs>